Hi, this is Brian Dolan with law firm Pepper Hamilton. Every month, Pepper partner Greg Novak hosts a webinar for West Legal Ed Center on investment management issues. This month, Mr. Novak was joined by Pepper partners Martin Bloor of our White Collar Defense Group and Julie Corelli of our Fund Services Group. Mr. Bloor will update us on recent enforcement actions under the FCPA, and Ms. Corelli will introduce our findings in the recently published report on private equity funds entitled Fees and Expenses 2016, a PFM benchmarking survey. This podcast is a recording of that webinar. If you're interested in the PowerPoint slides speakers reference during the webinar, please visit Pepper's Insight Center at www.pepperlaw.com where this podcast is posted. Well, thank you very much, and this is Greg Novak from Pepper Hamilton, and welcome to our last hedge fund investment management roundtable of the year. Um, happy holidays to all, and we hope to see you again in January when we will have our next session on January 26th. That session is slated to talk about uh, protecting your intellectual property for investment managers, uh, including potential business process patents, copyrights, trademarks, and other intellectual property devices. But today's program um, is kind of an interesting mix. Um, one, we're going to talk about Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, enforcement background and operations, and in particular, how it applies to the fund industry. And then uh, after we walk through that, we're going to talk about a benchmarking study that Pepper was a part of, dealing with fees and expenses in the private fund arena. So before we move into the actual substance of the program, I'd like my co-panelists to introduce themselves, starting with, ladies first, Julie Corelli. Hi, thank you, Greg. This is Julie Corelli. I am a partner at Pepper. Uh, I run our fund services group along with many others, including Greg. And I, I practice in uh, the middle market investment funds ranging from $10 million to $5 billion. And uh, all different strategies, real estate, hedge, debt, equity, venture, growth equity, uh, you name it. Well, thank you, Julie. Uh, obviously, Julie is going to be talking about the, the uh, expense benchmarking study. Martin, introduce yourself, please. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Martin Bloor from Pepper Hamilton. I'm a partner in the New York office in the White Collar uh, Litigation and Investigations Group. Uh, my practice uh, focuses primarily on um, uh, government investigations uh, of individuals and corporations with a uh, focus on the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And Paul. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Pelletier. I'm also with Pepper, Pepper's D.C. office. I'm also in the White Collar Investigations uh, Group, and um, like Martin, my practice focuses on um, representing individuals and corporations who are um, somehow involved in a government investigation or individuals or corporations who are doing um, some level of internal investigation. Um, those of you who were with us last month know that we did tee up the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act discussion a bit with uh, mention of the Oxif case and some others, which we're going to do a much deeper dive in today. But to kick things off, I'm going to turn to Martin. Martin, tell us, what's the background? Why do we have the FCPA? What's the paradigm? What are they trying to get at? Who are the people in the crosshairs? Who enforces it? Is this the FCC or is this the uh, Justice Department or the Treasury? Sure. So um, the, the FCPA is enforced uh, criminally by the Department of Justice, and it's also uh, enforced civilly by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, the, um, really, the, the people within the, the crosshairs of, um, of the FCPA are uh, companies that are doing uh, business internationally. So um, the FCPA... Um, basically uh, has two provisions, the anti-bribery provisions and the books and records provisions. And what it does is it, it uh, makes unlawful paying, um, making offers of corrupt payments to foreign officials uh, for purposes of, obtain, of obtaining or retaining business. Um, it also um, has a books and records provision that's enforced by the, uh, both criminally and civilly, but mostly by the SEC. Uh, and, and that provision applies to U.S. issuers, and it basically requires you to keep books and record, records that are accurate. All right, so stop me. Let me stop you there for a second. Um, you said it's the offer. Um, so merely suggesting 
um, that, hey, if you do this, I'll take care of you, is enough to bring it within the ambit of the FP FCPA, or do you actually have to pay, uh, you know, execute the bribe, so to speak? Uh, it, it is the uh, – the bribe does not have to be executed. It is the offer. Um, there are obviously a lot of different components that would have to fall in place, um, and in particular, um, the offer would have to be made to a foreign official in order to obtain or retain business. Um, it, 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 gets, it gets a little murky in practice, um, questions about what a foreign official actually is, and, um, and, you know, people think of bags of cash as a bribe, but it can be, you know, uh, things that are much different than that, things like, uh, lavish entertainment or, as we'll talk about uh, later uh, in the program, providing uh, jobs to children of government officials. Um, so although the statute seems uh, pretty clear-cut, uh, when you read it in application, it's a lot more complicated. So this is enforced by the uh, U.S. Department of Justice, so it is a criminal statute as opposed to a civil enforcement statute, but the FCC has concurrent jurisdiction? Correct. So the FCC um, um, has jurisdiction to pursue uh, actions civilly, and the DOJ uh, can pursue actions criminally. What you'll often see is joint investigations by both the DOJ and the FCC, and typically the cases are settled, and you'll see a settlement that has a, a criminal component to it, a civil component to it, and then typically the SEC will, in, in addition to a civil fine, uh, will order disgorgement of any profit. It is now also becoming um, even more common, uh, given the nature of what the FCPA is, to see uh, foreign government investigative bodies involved as well. So. Um, the Milan prosecutor, for example, is very active. Uh, the prosecutors in Germany are very active. So you also you often see a coordinated effort um, across the globe on these matters. So um, does this have to be enforced by treaty, or are these all informal uh, cooperations between Department of Justice and these foreign enforcement officials? Uh, so more and more it is um, – uh, being um, done in a cooperative manner. There's um, the OECD convention where um, uh, a number of different uh, countries participate and there's coordination in that by, um, by, by um, the criminal prosecutors. So it is, it is a, becoming more of a joint effort where there, there don't necessarily need to be formal requests made at this point. So, Paul, let's take this into a, uh, a real-life hypothetical. Um, a um, sovereign wealth fund, and we're going to concede that it is truly a sovereign wealth fund. This is the actual investment dollars of some principality, okay, engages a um, wealth manager in London. And a U.S. wealth manager is looking to gather those assets in order to invest in a fund or a product that the U.S. manager is running. And, of course, the Sovereign Wealth Fund sees that as an attractive investment opportunity, especially when you look at the big run-ups in the U.S. equity markets. So the U.S. manager <coughs> starts to entertain this wealth manager in London. Is that a foreign official? Well, uh, if, it's, if it's a wealth manager that doesn't um, have any... Um, employment status or contractual status with the sovereign wealth fund, probably not. But that's probably the least worrisome thing about the transaction. Okay, well, hold on. Let's let's make it absolutely clear. We've got someone who's employed by XYZ registered investment chartered investment advisors in London. Yes. Okay. They have full discretion. They quote unquote control the sovereign wealth fund in London. They have the absolute confidence of the principality to manage the money. So whatever they say goes. Is that going to be viewed as a foreign official? It could, it could be because the, the test is whether they're considered an instrumentality of the foreign government and control is, the, is the, probably the most important part of that test. So there is a possibility that an independent wealth manager 
because of the nature of the control he has over the assets of the principality, could be viewed as a foreign official. That's correct, or an agent of the foreign official. As an agent of the foreign official. Sufficient, sufficient to make that a um, bring that within the scope of the FCPA. Okay, so let's talk about what constitutes lavish entertainment. <laughs> because, <Fun part. laughs> right, because I'm sure there are people on this call who have been to dinners in London that, where they know it could easily cost a thousand pounds for two bottles of wine and uh, a roast duck. Well, well the, the, the good news is that no case has ever been brought just based on lavish entertainment. But when you read the cases that have been brought against companies or corporations, um, and there has been lavish entertainment, the government usually makes a big production of what that lavish entertainment was. And um, it, lavish entertainment can be anything from um, uh, illegal prostitution entertainment to bottles, $800 bottles of champagne. And when those facts are present then how far does the net go? Does it include just the U.S. manager who is providing the entertainment or his firm or all the way up the chain internally in the United States for that manager who's now caught in the crosshairs? It, it could go all the way up the chain in the United States. Um, one would have to look at sort of the facts of the case to see who authorized it, who understood what was happening, and who made those transactions happen or, or cause those transactions to occur. Okay, so what I've learned here is that agency can be a sufficient hook back to a sovereign wealth fund or a foreign official to make that agent, who we would otherwise think of an independent person, into a foreign official. And so you need to understand, presumably, who you're dealing with, because if they carry the mantle of authority, right? They have that bull of authority from the foreign government to pick managers, so to speak, or products, then you need to know who you're dealing with and that that very well may be a foreign official. That is correct. And certainly in a lot of these cases, it's the agent or the third party that's dealing with the foreign official, and that doesn't insulate um, the U.S. domestic company or the U.S. registered company from liability. And for those of you following along at home, we're now moving on to slide five. Um, you know, in practice, there was a recent case where a Chinese sovereign wealth fund official requested a U.S. company to provide family members with internships. Now, isn't this the way of the world? I mean, one would think that, you know, you know the people you do business with, and when you're looking for your kids to find a, a job, you call up people, your vendors, I guess, and ask them, hey, do you have any slots available? Yeah, sure, I, and and that is that is uh, you know oftentimes how the world world works. I think the distinction here and what what sort of transforms uh, you know that uh, you know can you can you provide a job to my nephew or my cousin or give him a look is that in in the particular cases that um, the DOJ has and the SEC has recently brought. Um, the premise was that the, the provision of jobs to the, the, the sons, daughters, family members of foreign officials was done in an effort to obtain or retain business. Um, so when you look at the facts of the cases, um, typically what, what had happened is there's – and it always comes up in emails because that's where everything seems <laughs> to happen. But, you know, there are emails that support that, you know, either – you know, in one of the cases, it was the foreign official of a well, it was a it was a sovereign wealth fund in the Middle East, and they were they were sort of pushing to get their uh, son and nephew a job, and using the you know I can do business elsewhere, I have other places that will that will give my son or nephew a job. Um, so it was clear from the emails that they were concerned about losing the business, and when they Actually hired the uh, the um, the son and the nephew. They went outside of the normal intern process. The interns actually wouldn't have been otherwise qualified uh, for the positions. Um, and then, um, unlike um, other interns, where the idea was they would continue with the company uh, and 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 move on to a permanent position, um, these were six month positions. And uh, were really designed to uh, to retain the business of the sovereign wealth fund. Um, so, 
you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, and this, this happens a lot. It, it, the, the issue is where there's the compliance program set up and, you know, one of the, uh, one of the, the things that the compliance program is designed to do is raise, you know, these sort of red flags along the way when people are going outside of that compliance program. And in the case that recently settled with JP Morgan, um, JP Morgan had a compliance program set up with a questionnaire to answer questions to see if there were any maybe improper relationships. Uh, and the managers in Asia were uh, falsifying the questionnaires when they were being sent back to the compliance department. So it's a lot of different factors, and it really is the tying it to business uh, that makes it uh, problematic. So it was the quid pro quo that was evidence in evidence mail, right? The email stands for evidence. Uh, but we also found, it seems to me, um, uh, a pretty crass attempt to hold up the potential granting of business in exchange for favorable treatment on the interns. So let's go through the looking glass and do another hypothetical here. Sure. Um, what if one of these large money center banks said, we have a program, and our program is specifically designed for the children of clients? They may not be qualified to do this work, but what we want to do is cement the relationship with these clients. And so come one, come all, we'll take them, we'll see if they have something there, and in six months we'll make a decision whether or not we're going to make a permanent hire. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think um, it, well, there, I guess there, there are a number of factors you would have to consider. Um, you know, first, uh, the FCPA would be implicated if we're dealing with, Foreign officials, so it wouldn't necessarily be all uh, all customers, um, friends, and oh no, we're specifically we're, we're basically announcing to the world <laughs> that well, you know our program is designed for the children of government officials. That, that. There's no <laughs> there's, there's no carve out in the FCPA. There's no safe harbor. No safe harbor for for, for company wide programs. Okay, <laughs> you're, you're still bound by the terms of the FCPA, at least as it relates to dealing with government officials and um, using bribes to retain or obtain business. Right. So I would say if your program was uh, – and, and it's not unlike um, the typical internship programs that, that for example, J.P. Morgan had. I, I think what we advise companies when they're dealing with this situation, it's not – it's not an automatic violation of uh, the FCPA to hire the son or daughter of a government official. It's, um, I, you know, the best practice is do you have a program set up to hire individuals? Um, I, I wouldn't advise a company to set up a, a government official program. It probably, um, probably would get a lot of scrutiny. But do you have a program set up, and are these officials, you know, being – run through that program and are they, you know, meeting the criteria that you would typically, uh, that you would typically use to assess those candidates? So a qualified candidate, um, basically it has to be a client blind criteria. I think, I think that's right. I mean, the issue is, you know, you're the son or daughter of a client that has a very large engagement with the bank is different than a client, son or daughter of a client with a very small engagement. Well, I, no yeah, I mean, I think the, look, the, what the FCPA prohibits is, uh, so giving something of value, but giving it a value with the intent to obtain or retain business. So while it, you may be able to say, well, I'm giving this job to, um, government official X's son, and I think there's a, there's sort of a question there whether that is something of value, but the DOJ has taken the position and there have been cases where they say that is something of value. But if there's no intent there to uh, obtain, or re obtain or retain business, um, then I think, you know, it's not, it's not as much of an issue. And, again, when the DOJ or the SEC are looking at these issues, they, they, they will look at, you know, the totality of the circumstances, right? So if it is – if it is this one-off where the person's not eligible and we're giving him business, we're giving him uh, a job, and we have a big book of business with his father's uh, sovereign wealth fund that he runs, um, you know that raises more eyebrows than if they're hired through a normal process. And although there is business there, 
uh, it's har- it's harder uh, when you have people removed from that business making the decisions to infer that there's some intent there to uh, to actually influence business. So it does turn on intent. Uh, it, d- it does turn on intent. So someone. The, the, uh, let me just clarify that the uh, the anti bribery provision turn on intent. The books and records are slightly different, but yeah, what we, we, we think of as as the bribe, uh, as opposed to recording the bribe. Uh, that's and one of the ways that the government looks at the intent or determines intent, sometimes they look at how you booked the transactions, and if you've um, fudged your books and records, that would be not only a violation of the books and records provision, but it would be also evidence that you intended to conceal sort of the relationship of that government official's kid with your company. Okay, but let's say we, there's no concealment. It's all in the open. Mm-hmm. The person comes through a standard internment, uh, internment, <laughs> <laughs> internship uh, program and meets all the requirements. Yeah. Uh, but just so happens that they, you know, are the son or daughter of a key government official. It, 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 it's a precarious area. Right. However, the FCPA is not a guarantee that kids, and children of public officials can't get jobs. So... They get hired all the time. There's proper ways to hire them. And there's improper ways to hire them. If you're going to do it, make sure it does within the course of the program. Make sure it's cleared. Make sure you have a compliance program. So let's talk about that books and records requirement for a second. Is this one of those where, you know, we're talking about Al Capone tax reporting? Had he reported all of his income, he never would have gone to jail? Or does the maintaining the books and records nevertheless provide evidence of, illegal activity, and it just becomes a compounded uh, offense, you know, if you don't have the books and records. Yeah, so I guess I guess at the end of the day, um, so the books and records provisions, basically, if you pay a bribe and you record it as a bribe, you might be okay on the books and records portion of it, but there's bribe. still a <laughs> bribe, so that's the issue, right? Um, but you can't cleanse a bribe by reporting it. Right, exactly. I mean, there's still the underlying conduct. Not, not in the United States. <laughs> right. But but remember, too, that the books and records provision uh, only applies to U.S. issuers. Um, so um, where it's not a U.S. issuer, where it's um, a domestic corporation or, or um, something like that, you're not going to have the SEC looking at it. You're not going to have uh, the books and records issues, but you can still have the criminal uh, anti-bribery issues. And sort of the flip side of that is that on the SEC books and records provisions, and we actually see this in the J.P. Morgan settlement, um, the J.P. Morgan settlement lists a number of um, um, situations where they hired uh, relatives of of clients. Um, And, um, you know, presumably – the anti-bribery provision, well, the anti-bribery provisions would only apply to where it's a government official. They list it out, and it looks like, although it's a little difficult to tell from the settlement, that in terms of figuring out disgorgement and uh, and a fine, that they've considered these private transactions as well, because the private transactions were recorded similarly to the the uh, the, the government official transaction. So. It doesn't have to be uh, a, a broad to a government official to be a books and records. Right. So the SEC will look at your actions, even if it's commercial or private bribery, in the context of application of the books and records provisions as well. Okay, so let's talk about some recent enforcement actions. Uh, slide seven, um, OXIF. Yes. What would happen there? Well, first of all, two things. Um, And we'll just backtrack for a moment to slide five, just to show you that the Department of Justice since 2008 had been warning um, uh, hedge funds and and, and, um, sovereign wealth funds that they were were looking or scrutinizing transactions within the context of the FCPA. So in 2011, they began investigating OXIF, um, which was certainly the first time that, that the government sort of has brought a case and really began investigating a hedge fund. So what what OXIF did or what they admitted to doing um, in the recent settlement were two things. One, that they became involved in a joint venture project, uh, a joint venture mining product, and 
mining project in the Democratic Republic of Congo um, with some government officials where bribes were paid, where OXIF knew and understood that bribes were paid, and they got involved in the, um, in the underlying enterprise in the first instance. The second aspect of that case, which is a little bit more nebulous in the way it's described in the settlement documents, is that uh, Libya invested some of their sovereign wealth funds in into OXIF, into, into certain programs within OXIF. And as part of that, they paid what I would call an agent's fee or a finder's fee that they didn't scrutinize or do due diligence on where that money went after they paid the fee, which is approximately 3% of the transaction. So $9 million. Uh, yes, $9 million. Actually, I think it was about $3 million because it was just part of the transaction. Oh, I see. Okay. So the government has alleged that some of that money ended up in the hands of government, unidentified government officials. So there are two aspects to that transaction, both of which involve bribes to foreign officials in Africa, one in Libya, one in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So private placement fees and fixer fees were the issue here were certainly the issue, and certainly regular fees in these types of transactions. Okay. Now, if the placement agent were a representative of a licensed registered broker-dealer that happened to be owned by the government official, does that change the complexion of things? Well, um, again, the government will scrutinize the intent and what all the evidence shows with respect to that transaction. I think maybe the better question would be, if the placement agent was a normal, ordinary placement agent, someone who had previously acted as a placement agent, um, and OXIF had done its appropriate due diligence, if they had a program set up where they could do due diligence, and the due diligence showed that the money was not going to a government official, then I think that... Um, everything would have been at least sanguine as it relates to that particular part of the OXIF settlement. Yeah, and, and just, just to be clear, in terms of uh, agent, and, and it comes up often in these cases, um, there's often a middleman that will come in and say, I have a relationship with the government, I have a relationship with the sovereign wealth fund managers, I can get you in the door, you know, I can do whatever, and, and they're going to charge you a fee for that. Um, you know, they can be, you know, a, a local private citizen. If they're facilitating a bribe payment to a government official, the entity making that payment to that agent is going to be the one responsible for that payment. And that's, what if it's not paid to the government official? It just goes to the placement agent. That, well, that's okay, right? If the if the if, if the placement agent is uh, not a government official and they're not. Uh, you know, they're not doing anything to give value to influence the transaction. That's well, the government fine. official and placement agent, you know, went to Oxford together. But right. th and that shouldn't matter. Right. That shouldn't matter. matter. And as a matter of fact, um, and, and initially it looked as if the placement agent didn't, in this case, didn't give the money to, to a pub some of the money to a public official. The government says it happened, Oxford admitted, admitted it happened. And so what the government's going to look to is to see if, and by the way, that could happen, and the company could be perfectly okay in the end if it did its due diligence on that placement agent and determined that that placement agent was not was legitimate and was not giving money to the and did everything they could to, to ensure that the money didn't go to the government official. Right. It was it a standard placement fee? Did this person you know have a legitimate entity that the money went to? Was the money sort of finagle to that person uh, later on. So if, 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 if the company, if the sovereign wealth fund or if the hedge fund had a due diligence system set up and they honored that due, due diligence and did it appropriately and legitimately, then I'm not so sure that they would be held responsible in the end for um, an FCPA violation. So uh, on slide seven, your last point here is that OXIF executives still face criminal exposure. Has there been any indictment or information or anything coming out of DOJ with respect to the individuals? No, there hasn't, except there has been um, an indictment of um, the representative in the Congo, not someone at OXIF, but 
the government has not said it has resolved all of its cases with the executives of OXIF, and um, the investigations, as far as I know, remain pending with respect to some of the executives of OXIF. So on slide eight, we had fairly significant penalties. Um, disgorgement, fines of $213 million, disgorgement of $199 million, hiring a compliance monitor, required to name a CCO for five years and separate from other functions, must enhance internal controls, policies, and procedures, and, of course, I'm assuming this means that you're on the government's hit list, right? Yeah, well, it does. So, so once again, there are a whole bunch of costs associated with an investigation, an FCPA investigation, and ultimately resolution. One of those costs is the criminal pe penalties you pay, the disgorgement you pay, all measured by, in some fashion, the amount of the bribes or the amount of profits, then you have the additional costs, which are uh, um, implementation of a, a compliance program internally, which OXIF apparently did not have. And then, even more importantly, you have, um, in some cases, the potential for implementation of an outside compliance expert. In this case, it's a monitor for three years. Again, totally expensive propositions, totally disruptive of, of your business. And I can guarantee you that your outside compliance monitor is not going to charge you two hundred. $13 million. That's not... No, but that's... I, mean, that's, that's I will volunteer to, that. to do that. It was, they're not cheap, I will tell no, you that. But not $213 no, million. No. But those are in addition. And then we also have... You have investigative costs. Then you have the cost of the internal investigation. So the, the fact that you didn't have a compliance system in the first instance creates all these potential additional costs um, that are layered on to both the penalties and the disgorgement that the government uh, ultimately will pay. Yeah, and I, I would just add, I mean, I think, I think you know, this is the first uh, big case in the fund industry. And, you know, in the settlement, they they attach to the, the agreement the type of compliance program that they expect, uh, you know, companies to put in place. And <clears throat> it's really, for companies in this space, it's important to see what their expectations are and, you know, work to meet those expectations. Because when an issue comes up, while a compliance program is not a defense uh, to, um, to an FCPA violation, the DOJ and the SEC will certainly look to what compliance program you had in place, how quickly it identified the issues, and how the company responded to it. And if you don't have that compliance program, um, you're going to be in worse stead with the government than if you did. You know, and, and in that regard, there's hard, concrete examples of companies that were um, not prosecuted because they had effective compliance programs in place. One of one of the examples is the Morgan Stanley case. Yeah, I mean, this is a classic example of pay me now or pay me later. Um, and, you know, what we like to, in our compliance side of the profession, call risk-adjusted returns. Uh, investment managers salespeople, and placement agents love to talk about the money they're losing because of the compliance limitations. Um, we usually respond by saying, well, um, if you do what you're planning on doing and you don't take these precautionary steps, then the return that you get will be negative, number one, and number two, it will be, um, you know, the kind of Wall Street Journal front page risk that Oxif had with the massive outflows of AUM that they experienced as a result of this, and you end up with a very low risk-adjusted return. And in the financial services world, uh, reputational damage sometimes can be greater than any of the criminal or, or civil penalties that you pay. Right. Now, in the Princeling hiring, uh, we're looking at slide 10 here, uh, we see the fines that were paid by BNY and J.P. Morgan Chase with respect to their um, student internships. But I really want to focus on the um, unemployee, uh, slide 11, in particular the, um, the Dimitri Harder manner. Uh, Paul? Yep. Um, well, in, 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 in these cases, uh, what we have is individuals who um, are participants in the bribe scheme, and in D Dimitri Harder it was um, – it was bribes paid to a European bank for reconstruction. And what happened was Dimitri Harder was the participant in that bribe scheme, and he was 
he, in throughout the course of of recent FCPA history, they're making an example of individuals within the financial services industry or within any industry that could prosecute cases to prosecute individual executives involved. Dimitri Harder was certainly one of them, but he's only one of a number of, of individuals that's been prosecuted um, by the Department of Justice recently in these types of cases. Now, in the Raymond James matter, uh, here's an employer, FINRA, fining and suspending an AML compliance officer for egregious failures. What were the facts of that case? What happened there? Well, um, in, in, the Raymond, in the Raymond James case, um, what you had was essentially um, a compliance officer who was not, doing, was, not, was not doing his job at all. And as a matter of fact, on a number of occasions, he was warned and understood that there were compliance failures. These were FCPA failures? No, these were not F okay. FCPA, FCPA failures in the, in the Raymond James case. Um, these were just compliance failures. And he was warned a number of times. And this one takes me here just to show that, that in addition to um, in addition to FCPA problems in the financial service world, the, the government is all, including FINRA, is also going after individuals who are not doing their compliance responsibilities as fin, FINRA dictates they ought to have. Uh, and then on slide 12, direct access partners. Uh, a Venezuelan bribery case. Yeah, direct access partners was a um, was a <clears throat> was a um, a broker dealer that was um, servicing Venezuelan government funds, and um, the Venezuelan government officials were paying huge bribes to these individuals. The the um, the government, the United States government, uh, charged five uh, executives in Direct Access Partners. They charged the Venezuelan official. And um, the SEC also disciplined uh, um, two extra people in that case that weren't prosecuted. So there was a, seven people in the financial services world that were uh, either prosecuted or dealt with administratively by the SEC and one Venezuelan official. How normally does the DOJ get their leads in these cases? Is this a whistleblower type thing or is it just a referral from a normal examination? I mean, how, how do they even know where to look? Um, in many cases, when I was with the department up until 2011, many of the times we got our, our leads through whistleblowers. Um, sometimes we get them just through SEC investigations. Um, there are a multitude of ways. Sometimes other corporations in the same field that are cooperating will, in essence, rat out fellow corporations or fellow businesses who are engaging in the same or, and, and similar practices. Or I'm assuming people who don't want to do this rat out others in order to try to level the playing field, too, because they have an un the other company that's doing it has an unfair advantage. That, that may be correct. And I, and I would say, too, and it, it seems counterintuitive, right, but the, you know, the DOJ has uh, in their mind that good corporate citizens, uh, when they learn that their company is engaged in, in wrongdoing, and particularly in the area of the FCPA, that they will uh, self-report the conduct, cooperate with the government, and uh, and ensure that uh, a the people that are uh, responsible for the conduct, uh, you know, something some action is taken against them uh, from an employment perspective, as well as you know providing the government with the information on their conduct, and b you know remediate the conduct uh, that occurred. And see, put in, you know, a compliance program, uh, or, you know, uh, remediate their compliance program in a way that um, addresses uh, the underlying conduct. And the government has, you know, a, a pilot program now for for non-prosecution agreements. That could be a whole other, uh, a whole other topic for another day. Um, they give cooperation credit, although, you know, some companies don't necessarily always see the benefit of that. So um, as counterintuitive as it may seem, a lot of um, a lot of the, uh, the the matters are actually self-reported by the companies. Themselves. Certainly, with respect to public traded companies. Yeah, yeah and, and then you know, slide 13. Uh, I don't believe that FCPA violations are capital crimes <laughs> in the U.S. Who knows? Maybe that'll change, but uh, not at the moment. No, and, and but but the purpose of this slide is really serious because um, in other countries do. Um, treat these types of crimes differently, these types of economic crimes differently. And as you, as you started off this 
this presentation, you talked about sort of the cooperation of other countries, what other countries are doing and how they're cooperating. And sometimes, um, while you might be able to effectively deal with and manage the expectations of shareholders and investors with respect to a U.S. investigation, when you're talking about investigations in other countries, um, they deal with these crimes in much, much different ways. And, and so that's something companies have to think about when they're dealing with these types of issues and why compliance programs and effective compliance programs sort of ameliorate some of these concerns. Okay. Well, thank you both for a great and fascinating presentation. Now we're going to talk about fees and expenses. Um, Julie, first of all, who are PEF Services and uh, Witham, Smith, and Brown? They were our colleagues in putting this survey together. PEF Services is a fund administrator, and Witham, Smith, and Brown is an accounting group. Okay. So tell us about the uh, genesis of the, of the uh, report and what you had hoped to accomplish um, and highlights um, changes from last year's report. Uh, well, this is the second, as you just alluded to, of two surveys done. Uh, the first one was in 2014, came out in October 14, the second one in November of 2016. Both are published in uh, PFM magazine, which is a publication of Private Equity International. It surveyed uh, approximately 100 in 2014 and another 100 in 2016. I don't know the identities of the survey participants, so I don't know how much overlap there is between the two, but I'm told there is some. PFM has the uh, sealed list of, of participants, uh, so we don't see it at PEF or Pepper. But, or but these are just U.S.-based funds? Not they are all U.S.-based funds, and they are in various strategies, as you can see uh, on the couple of slides that deal with um, in nice color and blocks and maps. Slide 17. Yep. Um, they primarily come from the Northeast, and second area of uh, concentration would be the Upper Midwest, so clearly um, Washington through Boston and then the Chicago market. Uh, there are roughly uh, a little over half in the growth equity and buyout area, and then the rest um, went through real estate diversified platforms, which might include senior um, uh, distressed debt or something like that, and then some mezzanine senior debt, um, a little bit in infrastructure, and then the proverbial other category. But there was no effort made to make this a quote-unquote statistically valid sample. This was... Uh... No, this is an anecdotal experiential sampling okay. of, of funds. Um, what you don't see in there is venture. So we did specifically avoid venture, and you don't see registered funds, so or hedge. mutual funds, and hedge. Right. So those three big categories are excluded. So you're really looking at the private fund market that manages money um, for private investors and deploys it in either debt or equity investments in private companies or in real estate. Okay, so moving uh, to slide 20, it looked like most of the respondents in, to the um, survey were on the financial side of the organization as opposed to um, operating officers or general counsel, for example. Yes, their uh, CFO and CCO, um, uh, depending on how they self-report, that could be the same person within an organization, so they could report a CFO, but it might be a CFO who has a CCO title as well. Okay. All right, so let's get into the meat of it. Uh, slide 21. Uh, first of all, what is ILPA, and what are the best practice templates? Institutional Limited Partner Association is ILPA. Uh, they have come out over several years with uh, the principles for private equity investing. Uh, they are called the ILPA principles. They came out with version 2.0 in 2012. And as part of um, their principles, they have a whole series of things that they would would like and expect general partners or sponsors of funds to have in their terms and conditions in order to attract institutional limited partners, and they are signed up to by institutional limited partners who are members of ILPA. But it doesn't seem like they've had significant penetration. If I'm reading this chart right, it's about between 20 and 30 percent? Well, this happens to relate to the best practice template for reporting fees. So they came out with a template, a reporting template that um, – if you were a, a large pension fund, it would be very useful, and you might impose upon a fund manager to 
use it because it allows the pension manager to track the experience of fund managers across different uh, funds using the same line items. So if their funds subscribe to the ILPA template and the pension plan manager looks at 10 different funds, he has a very easy mechanism for comparing and he has a very easy mechanism for understanding what fees, expenses are being charged at that fund, which gives them an expense ratio to track the performance of that fund and benchmark it against other things in their portfolio. That's from the investor's perspective. From the manager's perspective, it's an onerous template particularly for small managers, and if you see down here at the less than 500 million level, which is the bottom line, um, there's limited take-up, particularly limited take-up of that, and there's a large majority that just don't, don't use it for anything other than a capital notice because it provides a form or for quarterly reporting. Now, when you look at recent SEC trends um, in enforcement, especially during 2015 and 2016, where almost all the private fund enforcement actions that were brought other than OXIF were uh, against private equity funds on fee issues or something similar to fee issues. Um, is the expectation that uh, the use of a uh, best practices template would attempt to insulate the funds from that, or we're not that ambitious quite yet? We are not that ambitious. Okay. Uh, there, there's no <laughs> implication that using the ILPA template will <laughs> – because, you know, it's like a computer software program. It's all in the inputs, right? right? So if you're using the template and you're putting lots of things on the fund, the SEC's issue with that is maybe you didn't disclose that you're actually charging that fee to the fund or that expense to the fund. So if you then report it on a template, like the books and records reporting for FCPA, it, it doesn't insulate you from the fact that you actually had a problem. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so let's move on a little bit. Um, Let's talk about, uh, on slide 24, the expense analysis itself. Uh, the question, how do you answer expense-related queries that are not addressed in the PPM, LPA, or policy documents? I was fascinated that, um, you know, there's no uniformity in who decides um, what information and how that information should be presented. And what's amazing is that 44% have a team decision approach to it. Um, and, you know, this is, it, if you think about the issues that come up during the life of a fund and how you, when you're writing a PPM and a limited partnership agreement, you need to have that crystal ball to be able to see 10 or 15 years forward and say, what are the things that I could encounter as fees and expenses in the life of this fund? And the SEC wants you to disclose that as much as possible. They... Um, something short of abhor <laughs> categories of fees and expenses, and they want specific, specific almost line items, which is where the ILPA report can actually help trigger thought processes on fund managers. But it's really impossible to think through all the things that you're going to encounter in 10 or 15 years. And so you do end up with categories. And so you end up with questions. And who decides the question of whether it gets charged to the fund or the management company pays it and the managers are sitting around the table saying, well, do we pay it or we charge it to investors? And the temptation is always to say, we don't want to pay it. We would charge it to investors. And that probably explains why you see 44% of the management team deciding, which is a group decision because it really is a group exposure. And when you're really not sure, you know, you can consult the limited partner advisory committee or you might discuss it with a few large LPs who might have an objective viewpoint depending on the relationship with you. Now, the interesting thing is if you look at the analog to the registered fund world or the closed-end fund world or the BDC world, um, each of those entities has an independent board. And that independent board, it might take a recommendation from the investment advisor as to where the allocation should go, but the independent board would make that decision and there would be no questions as to the what well, it might be, again, you non-uniform, but they would take counsel, they'd talk to the accountants, and they would then make a decision. And that's the very reason why you're starting to see a lot of limited partners in their slide letters ask for specific disclosure every year on fees and expenses, so they can assess whether the decisions are being made independently. LPAC's limited partner advisory committees, they never have, in my experience, they never have their own counsel. They may consult because there are representatives of limited partners in it. They may consult their internal counsel at the limited partner, but there's not one 
lawyer who's representing the LPAC as a whole. It's not that adversarial kind of relationship. Um, but you do have people who are independent of the managers, and you do have people who, if the manager doesn't pay, would be bearing the brunt of that expense. So if they're making that decision and they're saying that the fund should pay it, that is the imprimatur of, of uh, acceptability because you have the person burdened with the decision actually deciding it's a fund expense. So is there any move afoot now in the private fund space, certainly not in hedge, but perhaps over in private equity, um, for uh, funds and management companies to essentially create boards of trustees? for funds and empower them to make these decisions? Beyond the LPAC, no. No? That's not happened in the industry yet. Okay. Um, and, and nor does the LPAC have, maybe this is your next question, any independent directors on it. Right. That's <laughs> and, and typically the fund manager doesn't have an independent That's director. Right. It is the partners of the fund management team that serve as the board governing the fund manager. The future, who knows. Um, okay, so uh, turning to slide 25, we're going to talk about some specific expenses. Um, so, you know, slide 25, we're talking about bringing in a technology-driven system. Who covers the cost? And um, this was fascinating to me that in the um, trading platform, the management firm is covering the cost in 70% of the cases. Uh, even though, well, I guess if it's only one fund, you theoretically could push that onto the fund. Um, but if you have multiple funds, then obviously it's serving multiple masters, and you would have to have the management company pick up an expense like that. But uh, the one that was uh, somewhat interesting to me was um, fund accounting. Hmm. Um, I mean, it is a fund accounting system, but it's the management firm that's picking up the expense and was wondering if there was any indication in the data, comments or whatever, as to why that would be as and not purely a fund expense. It's like saying that an administration of a fund is a fund expense. So keeping the books and records of a fund is normally the bailiwick of the manager. And they hire a CFO, and they have controllers, and they have bookkeepers. So it's the like toolbox the concept. It's, it's the expectation right. that the manager comes with a full toolbox. However, in smaller funds, and remember that roughly 80% of these funds that responded are under a billion, it is very common to outsource that because you don't have a large team to, to do that. So once you outsource the administration, books and records, you hire somebody to help you with your capital calls, manage the money coming in, all of that accounting, where the expenses actually get reported, you will have the fund pay that expense. But you have to have disclosed it up front in the PPM that you're going to do that, and so the investor makes a decision uh, based upon that knowledge that is going to be in the fund. And frequently that leads to negotiation. Okay, well, how much is that going to cost all the investors, or how much is the total expense of the fund going to be, and is there some cap on that? And that's a very common negotiation these days. Shifting gears, the next several slides deal with uh, operating partners and the expenses of operating partners. So for those in our audience who may not be as familiar with the private fund model, what exactly are we talking about here? Set the scenario. Uh, who is the operating partner, and why is this so important to the allocation of expenses between the fund and the management company? An operating partner is a non-employee. It actually uh, could come from a consulting group, but when someone says an operating partner, they're usually referring to an individual. And they are often on retainer, with retainers paid by the management company for the fund. And they're a uh, bench. They are the strength and depth of the bench of the management team to provide industry expertise, help search for, for management talent evaluate personnel and management talent in portfolio companies, depending on whatever the specific skill set of the operating partner might be. But by the word partner, I'm assuming they're an investor in either the management company or the fund? Not usually. Not I mean, usually. they might be, but okay. there's no connection between that name and that. They're a partner in the sense that they, like a contractual partner. Oh, I see. We, so, are, we are here so, to help you, and we're partnering with you to help you make your portfolio companies better and add value to the team that runs the fund. So they could be a accounting consultant, controller consultant, compliance consultant, someone like that? They're usually more uh, 
uh, CEOs from CEO. industry okay. who have stepped out of industry, retired CEOs, um, deep expertise in, say, infrastructure or in government regulation of healthcare companies or pick a sector and they'll have a very deep expertise in that sector and those would be the sectors that the private fund is targeting in its investment. But there's no other relationship with the management company other than perhaps a contractual consulting relationship. 99% of the time, that's true. I could never say, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So, so that consultative person is then um, put on retainer inside of a uh, portfolio company. In the first slide here, slide 20. So they're, they're on retainer with the management, management company, company, and then they go work at the portfolio, portfolio company. company. And half of the time in 2014, there was no offset against the management fee. Um, and in 2016, we've seen a decided movement to no offset. Right. And this is um, a direct correlation to issues raised on presence exams out of OC. Uh, they were asking a whole lot of questions about operating partners. It made it into a, a couple of the speeches uh, from the Sunshine speech on forward. And there was... Um, a lot of cleanup that was done within management teams and reflecting their relationship with operating partners clearly. So if you looked at a fund's website and you saw the partners of the management team listed out there, A, B, C, D, and number C had the name operating partner underneath it, but everybody was listed alphabetically, you would think that that person, that operating partner, was actually a member of the management team and didn't know that his he or she is spending one day a month talking to the management team. So those operating partners, that was one issue for them in, in setting their relationship straight. But they are there um, really to help add value to portfolio companies, and they often go on the board in addition to a manager from the fund. And they, because they're not employed by the fund management team, management company, that they can receive a cash director fee. So it makes sense company. that there would be no fee offset because there's no other relationship. Right, until you look at the website and right. say, okay, but it really looks like they're a part of your team, so why are they Why are they getting a cash fee and is it not being offset pursuant to the terms of your limited partnership agreement as a director fee paid to the management team, therefore reducing the management fee you can charge the fund? One other instance where the Internet is the bane of our existence. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. if the website, I mean, people put these people on the websites because they're trying to look bigger than they are, right, and gain the osmosis value of the additional credential. Okay. So uh, 2014 to 16, you're seeing the, the clear clean cleanup of the of issues the that yeah. were, were going on. All right. So we move to um, page 27 or slide 27. If the firm stops paying the retainer, would you offset the direct fee against the fund's management fee? Again, clear preponderance, no. And uh, when the operating partner sits on the portfolio company board, does it pay them a director's fee? No. Okay. This is, again, consistent with that cleanup and the mm -hmm. defining of the relationship between between the two in entities. Um, when the operating partner sits on the portfolio company, does it pay them a director fee? That's actually the same question. Yeah. Before. And if you answered yes, if the firm ceases to pay them, would you offset the cash director's fee against the funds management fee? Even more so. Even no. more so. And no, that's right. Okay. So would you offset any equity options the portfolio company grants to the operating partner? And the answer, again, is no, again. But by a much bigger preponderance. Much bigger, yes. And that's interesting because there was um, at least one presence exam where I know an issue came up where operating partners received options in the portfolio company, and the options had greatly appreciated between the day they got them and the day the SEC was questioning the, que questioning the uh, offset against management fee, and it would have been an offset for the current value of the options if the SEC had prevailed on that issue, but they withdrew the issue. But in each of these cases, again, this appears to be um, just a crystallization of the distinction between the operating partner and the management company. And it doesn't make sense that if I hire inside of a portfolio company, someone who's completely unrelated, has no financial involvement in the management company, that I would offset any of these. Yes, exactly. Unless, of course, if they're doing my job for me, yeah. right? You, they, they have no employment relationship with the management company, but operating partners often, as compensation, aren't just getting cash. They're having a piece Back of carry cash. Yep. from the fund. Okay. So, obviously, 
that could be why there are still some offsets. It's a, it's a tangled <laughs> web. Yes, okay. Um, all right, let's move to uh, other types of expenses, slide 32 in particular, SEC examinations. Following a routine exam, regulators found a deficiency round valuations. You redo the last two quarters reports and deliver them along with an explanatory letter to your LPs. Who pays the accounting and legal fees? So, uh, obviously, the management firm is paying a significant chunk of this um, in the middle market size and the two billion to five billion. Um, that is, in, in a, I guess, a form of liquidated damages where the management company is admitting its negligent activity and is essentially cleaning it up, right? Uh, yes. Maybe. Without an actual admission. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Practically speaking. So if you think of the practical way it unfolds, and our colleagues on the other side of the table here are smiling, uh, <laughs> you, you, you are accused uh, by the SEC of, of shenanigans relating to valuation, and you used a inflated valuation in order to do something, either sell more securities or enhance a secondary <laughs> deal, or just build your reputation, induce people to invest in your next fund, could be anything. And you go in and you say, but wait a minute, it was actually right. We may not have had all the backup needed for evaluation, or um, we just plain disagree with you on the methodology that we should have used. We think our methodology is right, and you're declaring a different methodology. And you get into this big argument with the SEC, which then, of course, you want to get out of because that gets you into an enormous amount of expense and time and resources. So you sell. And that settlement then results in, okay, you're going to go and restate this to your LPs. The SEC feels like it got its pound of flesh, and there might be a penalty, which we'll get to the next question on. And you actually have to um, do some corrective reporting to your LPs. So you hire your accountants, you get the lawyers to review the letter, et cetera. So that is why I think you see a lot of this actually charged to the fund because the management team believes it didn't do anything wrong and that this is a cost of restating fund financials so that they go out to investors. And I don't really read the green line as any admission on the part of the management team. I think it's more of a practical solution thing. We don't want to burden our LPs and expose them all to this. They're going to look behind it in the financials, and we'd rather just keep it in-house in the management company. Julie, we're about out of time, but before we close, any final um, observations or suggestions? Uh, I commend to all of you on the, the, the phone um, here the report slides that are contained in the materials. They are fascinating as you go through them. Uh, and if you would like a deeper dive, you're certainly welcome to join us in New York this evening for the live presentation of all of these slides when uh, we will do a much deeper dive. But um, any parting words on, um, on the expense allocations and the report? Well, I would only uh, add a caveat. It is very hard in survey questions, uh, 38 or 40 questions here, to capture the granularity that managers need to have when they're dealing with fees and expenses. I had one CFO put it that every $7 lunch tab that gets turned into her for reimbursement from a portfolio, uh, from a from a managing director at the fund, she has to decide where it goes. And every CFO faces this quandary. There is no automation of the process. It's a lot of judgment calls. And it's, that's a good reason you started with this. It's not statistically uh, sound. It's anecdotal. And it's all about who responds. But it does give you a sense of the issues people deal with, how difficult it is to address all of the types of fees and expenses you have, and how they can change along the continuum of time as you do transactions. There's a whole series of slides in the back of this as to if it's an expense before an LOI, if it's an expense after an LOI, and you're entertaining a CEO who's the prospective CEO, and you take them out. Hopefully you don't buy the $800 bottle of wine, but <laughs> you buy nice wine and you take them to the duck dinner, and <clears throat> then you've got an expense you have to book. Where do you book it? Right. And every single one of those judgment calls is subject to question in hindsight three, four, five years later upon review by the agency. Well, um, thank you to my panelists today, um, Paul, Martin, Julie. 
Um, certainly, if any of you have any uh, follow-up questions, feel free to contact our speakers or me. Uh, our biographies and contact information are at the back of the deck. We certainly appreciate your attention today and look forward to seeing you at our next event, as I said, uh, January 26th. Have a great holiday season, and thank you for joining us today.